a little bit of a shorter chapter as we're going through Revelation. I'm not necessarily doing chapter by chapter. Sometimes I'm uh, just, you know, if there might be two or three different points that we want to cover in a chapter. But we're at 15 now, and it's really kind of a short chapter anyway. And the main thing I want to focus on is verse 3, where it says, And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. And so I want to talk about the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. And just an interesting thought. You may have noticed it before and thought about it. But the, uh, the life of Moses is a little bit of a type or a picture of Christ. You know, there's a lot of characters in the Bible that you can see that. And it seems pretty... Uh, you know, like something that we're supposed to recognize as you're reading through the Bible. And you notice, I just want to point that out uh, for introduction, just point out some of the ways in which these are different. And let me, not only not, not just that, but as we're supposed to follow Christ, and as we recognize that when we follow Christ, things are going to happen to us as Christians that happen to Christ. That's what he said, right? For instance, you'll be persecuted just like I was persecuted and all. Uh, well, if Moses is a type of Christ, then what we can see is that Moses' life also pictures the life of a Christian as well, okay? And so here's some interesting thoughts. Number one, the enemy was after both of them from the time they were born. Okay, look at Exodus 1. We'll jump back and forth. I mean, not one verse. Uh, yeah, it's one. Uh, we'll jump back and forth between Exodus and Revelation here. Exodus 1. Start in verse 15, it says, And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shifra, and the other name was Pua. Uh, and he said, When ye do the office of the midwives to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him, but if it be a daughter, then she shall live. And of course, you know, the story goes, the midwives feared God and they wouldn't do that. Praise the Lord. And then whenever we get to verse uh, or chapter two, verse one, it says, And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took him, uh, took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river, uh, by the river's brink. So you see this idea that right from his birth, he was in a situation where they are seeking his death. Well, doesn't that sound a lot like Jesus? Okay, so let's look at uh, actually Matthew chapter 4. No, Matthew chapter 2, sorry. Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 3. We hear this every Christmas season about Herod trying to kill Jesus. It says, When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And of course, you know the story. He sends out the wise men to, to go find where Jesus is so he can worship him too, which we know wasn't his intent. You get to uh, verse, let me see here. Uh, you know, he asked, the, he asked when, uh, where Jesus was supposed to be born. They sent him to Bethlehem. Let me see what, uh, verse 16 says, uh, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, remember the Lord uh, showed them in a vision not to return that way. Herod, it says, he was exceeding wroth. And he sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coast thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. And, of course, we see this again in Revelation 12. Uh, there's definitely a similarity, although I think it's not so much talking about Jesus himself, but just kind of the godly seed, if you will. Uh, so, so the, the, again, the Christian, the believer, this is representative of it. But we see there in uh, Revelation 12, verse 4, it says, And his tail, talking about Satan, uh, the dragon, his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Verse 5, we see for sure it's talking about Jesus. It says, She brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God 
and to his throne. So we see that the enemy was after Jesus from the very beginning, after Moses from the very beginning. And the enemy, guess what, is after the believer. It's from the time you were saved, you know, uh, you better expect that Satan is going to be seeking to devour you. He's going to be an accuser of the brother, and he's going to try to destroy you, turn you against people, get you to fail, get you to quit on following Jesus. And, and uh, this is the life of the believer, okay? Now, after uh, we see th uh, this uh, time of their life where they're, they, they end up, you know, being spared from this and all, then we see also in their life there was a time of temptation, Okay, Matthew 4, 1, of course, all the Gospels, uh, I don't think John, I don't think John explains it very well, but Matthew uh, chapter 4, we see the temptation of Jesus. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, and when he was when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungered. And you know the story about how he begins to be tempted there by Satan. Well, if you look over at Hebrews 11, Hebrews chapter 11, we know that at some point, although Exodus doesn't specifically spell out when that time was but some at some point Moses had to make a decision was he going to follow the Lord or was he going to uh, stick with his upbringing there in Egypt and so we find in verse 26 of Hebrews 11 oops 26 says or let's start with uh, 24 by faith Moses when he was come to years refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of, season, uh, of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, uh, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. You compare that with, with uh, Jesus' temptation, and you see kind of the same thing. He's tempted with all these things, and Jesus had to say, look, turning that into bread, that's, not, that's just going to satisfy me for a moment, but you know, far greater you know, of course, I don't think he was ever actually possibly going to do those things, but he felt the temptation of it, and he had to go through that. But not only did Moses go through that, not only did Jesus go through that, guess what happens to every believer? And I, and I think there's something significant about this, I really do, is that you notice it was right after Jesus' baptism that he's led away into the wilderness. And I always tell people this after I baptize them. Uh, I mean, hopefully it would be nice if we could baptize people right after they get saved. Right. But sometimes that doesn't happen. And I'm telling you, I've seen people where after they get saved, doesn't seem like a big deal. Everything in their life seems fine. But the moment they get baptized, I don't know what it is, but it's like they have this moment of testing families attacking them. You know, they they start having doubts, uh, things go wrong in their life. And I've seen a lot of people right after their baptism, they just quit coming to church, quit trying to serve the Lord. It's unfortunate because you kind of need that testing time. You kind of need that to, to take that first step and to get out there and learn, you know. Uh, I just started a, just started a new job, and, and last night he worked, for the first time he worked a night shift all by himself. And, uh, and he's, he's just kind of like didn't have any sleep, and then he came back and went to, went to church, and I'm telling him, hey, I know it's, you're tired. I know you're going to want to quit. I know this is going to be rough. I'm not saying he said he was going to quit, but I just know human nature. You're going to have a time of tempting and testing, but you're going to have to endure that. You have to go through all those so that you can get better and you can learn what to do. And eventually, you know, your job will be a breeze. Christian life will never be a breeze, but Christian life has to go. You have to go through that trial and that testing so you can be build your faith and get stronger. And this is something that we see from the life of Moses and the life of Jesus. OK, we see that uh, they both had a special calling to fulfill uh, at the right time. You know, Moses uh, in Exodus three, you don't have to turn there, but he sees the burning bush. And he's given a, a, a job. Hey, you're going to go stand before Pharaoh and you're going to deliver my people. And he goes and he kind of makes his ministry public, if you will, just like Jesus eventually makes his ministry public. And he goes forth or John the Baptist says, behold, the Lamb of God was taken away the sins of the world. Interestingly, uh, at first, if you compare those two stories, uh, at first, the people believe Moses. 
Right? He goes and he tells them all that God had said. They see some signs and some miracles, and it says that they believe. But it's not very long before the people all of a sudden reject Moses, don't they? And, uh, and the same thing was with Jesus. Let's see. Uh, let's go to Exodus. Mm, let's see here. Well, let's go to uh, actually John chapter 1. John chapter 1. I didn't write down where it says that they believe Moses, but then we do know, obviously, there's, a, there's murmuring and there's a time where the people, uh, you know, are mad at him because their, their labor now intensified because they said, hey, you guys do this because, uh, you know, you're idle. And then he gives them more work they have to go. So they turn to Moses and they say, look, you know, you're against us. You cause us to be uh, a stinking saver in the nose of, of Pharaoh or however he says it. And so what he's saying is that, you know, they basically were turning on Moses. And we see all that. The Hebrew children that constantly murmuring, complaining, you know, blaming Moses and all that. But look at John chapter 1. Verse 11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Of course, all the chapter, uh, a lot of the chapter one here is talking about how they rejected him. He came to his own; they did not receive him. He was like the light, and the darkness comprehended it not. Okay, so he was rejected. And guess what happens? Christians live the Christian life, trying to serve the Lord. You, people aren't going to want you around. You're going to be rejected. Oftentimes, rejected by own family, sometimes, or rejected by uh, people at your your job or whatever. This is kind of just the life, the Christian life that we can expect to live. That sounds a little depressing, but <laughs> the news gets better, okay? All right, so then uh, uh, the last thing is that they take their people that, that are following them, they take them out of trouble right before God pours out His wrath. Now, you know where I'm going with that, right? But Moses leads his people, and what do you, they go through all the plagues, spared from the plagues, and then they go through the Red Sea, and as soon as they get past the Red Sea, you know, then all the enemy is destroyed. And this is what Jesus said, this is what's going to happen for those who continue to follow Jesus, as we'll see later on. But back in Revelation 15, we see that they sing a song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. Okay, now, in the, in the, chrono, in the chronology here, we see that we're going we're gonna to read in chapter 16 about the wrath being poured out. Now, I can't recap too much, but if you've been following along, we've actually read about the wrath being poured out. We're going to read about it again, okay? Uh, but right here, this song, it's like it's telling you this is what happens in heaven. And, it's, and it doesn't kind of, uh, because of the way the story flows, you're getting this song before you actually see the wrath. But the idea is that they're singing this song because they had a great victory. All right. And it's normal and right. We see that, that the people would cheer and celebrate and sing songs after they win a victory. And the songs that they're singing here, remember, this is in heaven. Now, when the, in, in Revelation 4, when John first sees into heaven, he's seeing a lot of singing going on. He's seeing Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, the angels are singing. He's seeing the 24 elders and the beast, and everybody's singing praises to the Lord. By the way, I think there's a lot of singing in heaven. <laughs> if you say you don't like singing, you better start practicing. <laughs> You'll like singing it when you get to heaven. Uh, but I think there's a lot of singing going on in heaven. You say, oh, I don't like singing. It's going to be so boring. No, you'll like it. Trust me. But there's going to be a lot of singing. And here is a time of singing like uncontrollable celebration, just excited about what's going on because finally the, uh, the end is here and God gets the victory. So, but let's first talk about the Song of Moses, okay? The Song of Moses. Now, I'm going to give you a couple, just real quickly, here are a couple things that people have so, subject uh, uh, su submitted as possibilities for the song of Moses. Deuteronomy 31. 
In other words, if you read commentary, they'll say, well, the Song of Moses, and then they'll point to these possibilities. Deuteronomy 31 says, Moses went and spake these words unto all Israel, and he said unto them, I am 120 years old this day. I can no more go out or come in. Also the Lord hath said unto me, Thou shalt not go over this Jordan. The Lord thy God will go over uh, before thee and will destroy thee. Uh, anyway, keep reading there. Uh, Be strong and of good courage. Verse 7 says, and Moses called Joshua, and he said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of good courage, for thou must go with this people. Let's see, verse 9, he, he wrote this law and delivered unto the priest. Come on, where's the song? And so uh, somewhere in here they say that this is a possibility for one of the songs. That he said. Here it is, verse 22. Moses therefore wrote this song the same day, and he taught it to the children of Israel. And he gave Joshua the son of Nun a charge and said, Be strong and of the Lord uh, uh, and, and of good courage, for thou shalt bring the children of Israel into the land which I swear unto thee, and I will be with thee. And so all the that he had, he had read here in the last... Uh, portion of scripture, you know, is all what he's saying is a song, okay? Uh, I'm not sure where that actually starts. Uh, now, verse 19, Now for write ye this song, and teach it to the children of Israel, and put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. And, uh, and so, anyway, this is saying, hey, maybe this is the song that Moses was talking about. Uh, I got a little, I'll get off on there, but look at Psalm 90. Here's another possibility. Obviously, you know, I don't I don't believe these are the songs that it's talking about, but there are a lot of songs, in other words, that Moses sang. And then, and then the book of Psalms, it makes sense. Hey, we're supposed to sing psalms, right? Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. And so in the book of Psalms, we actually have a song that was written by Moses. And so some say, there you go, you're, writing this, you're singing the song that Moses wrote. So you got Psalm 90. It says, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. But we know it was also a song, okay? That's why it's put into this, uh, into this section. Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever Thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, Thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return ye, children of men. For a thousand years in, the sight, uh, in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. <clears throat> thou carriest them away as with the flood, they are as asleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up, in the morning it flourisheth and groweth up, in the evening it is cut down and, wi and withereth. For we are consumed by thy anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquity before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are three score years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. And you're reading this and you're thinking, hey, this is a good song to sing in heaven, right? We're in heaven, so we're singing about how good God is and how, you know, we lived our life and all this kind of stuff. But in the context and as you read along, we see that this song is clearly something that's sung as a song of victory. And so I believe that the only possibility here is Exodus 15. Of all the Moses' songs, you could say, that are in the Bible... Exodus 15 is right after they come out of the Red Sea and, uh, and, the, and Egypt is destroyed. And then it says, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him in habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his, horse, uh, and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. 
Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. And in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. I mean, I, this sounds like it's, we've been reading in Revelation, and we see the wrath of God when it was poured out. And doesn't that sound very similar to what he does in Revelation? I'll show you the similarities here in a minute. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The floods stood upright as in heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. We're at verse 9. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow with, the, with thy wind, the sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. I love all the descriptions. Descriptions he's given. Uh, who is like thee unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretchest out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength un in, unto thy holy habitation, that the people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestina. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab trembling shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thine arm, they shall be as still as a stone. Till thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over which thou hast purchased. I'll stop right there. But you see, this is a great song that was sung. And I don't know how it sounded. I wish I did. I wish there was a recording so we could hear how all the, all the psalms were to be sung. And all the, uh, I probably would learn Hebrew then if I actually had a, a recording and I could tell what they were saying. And, uh, and we could actually hear those, what it would sound like, how, how interesting it would be. We don't know what it sounded like, but here's what we do know. After all this was sung, look at verse 20. And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. You know what timbrels are? They're like little, uh, 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 what are those things called? I always forget. The uh, tambourines. Yeah, kind of like tambourines, but they're small tambourines, I think, is, or cymbals, maybe? Are they more like cymbals? Something that they would sing with, and they would uh, dance around, and they would have that on their hands, to little bells or something. That they, I'm hearing all kind of different messages. <laughs> Musical instrument, okay? And they would, uh, and so she's leading all the ladies, you know, and she's the prophetess here, and she's singing this song, backing up Moses, kind of like a chorus, you know what I mean? Or an interlude uh, that's being sung there. And it's a time of rejoicing. Why? Because the enemies have been, you know, uh, uh, avenged. Now, here's interesting. This morning, in, uh, this morning, I was in Luke 18. Let's go there real quick. In Iola, and we were talking about praying for your adversaries. Okay? Luke 18. And, you know, for the first part... Let me just read this to you. I won't re-preach the whole message, but I'll just give it in a nutshell. I'll read the first part. This is a parable. This is where we are in Luke, the words of Christ. He says, He spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward... He said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, saith, And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, Shall he find faith on the earth? So it's interesting that he's talking about praying for your enemies. And, the, you know, most of the sermon I was just talking about how we're supposed to pray for our enemies. Bible says we're supposed to love our enemies. We're supposed to pray for them, right? So we don't necessarily just go around every time someone does us wrong and pray, you know, for their sudden death or, you know, pray that uh, their car would blow up while they're driving it or that they would get some kind of disease or something like that just because they did us wrong. 
That's not what we're supposed to do. Okay, we're supposed to, first of all, try to win them and forgive them and get them to repent and to get that right, and then we forgive them. Then we restored our brother, right? Now, if they're lost and they're doing us wrong, could be they're not saved. We want to get them saved. We want to get them uh, to hear the gospel and have a chance uh, to get saved. But there does come a time, in the end of the message, I talked about how there does come a time when there are those who continue to do wrong. Or maybe they're not hurting you, but maybe they're hurting innocent children or they're harming uh, you know, uh, innocent people. And, and, and there's not much that you can do in your hands because we don't have that, that calling to go out and physically you know, get, a, get our own vengeance. Vengeance belongs to the Lord, right? So we're supposed to pray and say, at some point, pray and put it in God's hands and say, God, you need to take care of the situation. Would you, you know, how about the Apostle Paul turns one man over for the destruction of the flesh? He turns him over to Satan, right? Why? Because that was the only way he could, he could, you know, get the situation resolved and uh, stop him from corrupting the church and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, there are times where we have to do that. I feel like it's kind of like a, like a last effort, you know what I mean? When we've tried everything else and now we know, hey, this person probably reprobate or whatever, they're causing harm. Uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're stopping the work of God from, from going forward. Well, then, yeah, there comes a point where you say, God, I can't do it. I, I, if, if I could devise a way to get even with this person, I would, but you could do it so much better. So I'm having you get e even for me. You know, you do the vengeance. And, uh, and he says, look, if, God, if this unjust judge would, would, would avenge this lady just because she kept coming and asking and asking. He doesn't even fear God. He's not even a just guy. But he goes and he helps this lady because she keeps asking, how much more is God going to deliver you from your adversary? But you see that so in this context, he's clearly talking about end times because he says, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on earth? And if you look back at chapter 17, he just gets done talking about uh, in that day, you know, uh, uh, he which is, shall be on the housetop and his stuff be in the house, let him not come down and take it. Uh, you know, we're clearly talking about end times. And he says, as in the day of Lot, as in the days of, of Noah. And so we're talking about end times. And so he seems to be making this comparison and he's talking about he will. Look at verse 8 again. You're Luke 18, verse 8. I tell you that, or verse 7 actually. And shall not God avenge his own elect? I don't have time to go there, but if you read Matthew 24, Jesus talks about the vengeance of the elect, okay? And uh, in Revelation 16, it's the elect that are saying, how long, God, before you avenge us? And it's because uh, uh, they're going through great persecution. We don't even know it. In, our, in America right now, we don't know persecution. Not really. Not really. You know, the most somebody do is, is uh, take a jab at us online. I'm being so persecuted. Somebody's chewing me out on, on Facebook. <laughs> Not a problem, real easy solution. You know, unfollow, <laughs> you know, or delete. That, that's it. That's all we have to do. We don't have to really take vengeance into our own hand. But there's coming a time when we all know this, where the God's church is going to experience some persecution that we don't have any control over, but they're actually constantly trying to stop us. Uh, maybe in the next four years, who knows? <laughs> stop us from preaching the gospel trying to stop us from preaching against homosexuality or stop us from, uh, you know, just wh whatever. We can see the signs. We can see things coming. And, uh, and certainly God will avenge his own life. There's going to come a time when we can't do anything except say, God, we're leaving it in your hands. But look what it says next. It says, And shall uh, not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? It's like this judge that keeps waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. Look, he's, he's taking time, and people are starting to wonder, is he ever going to avenge us? Is he ever going to do this? And this is what they say again in, uh, in Revelation 6. How long doth thou, you know, uh, until you avenge us? And here's what he says. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Now, that doesn't mean, hey, as soon as you ask him to avenge you, he's going to do it in a hurry. No, because he just said, oh, he bear long. You know, it could be a long time before he ever answers. But rest assured, when he does answer, he's answering speedily. <laughs> it's coming just like in the days of Lot. As soon as they came out, boom, fire came down, destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Just like in the days of uh, Noah, as soon as they got that ark, 
rain started coming down and, and, and destroyed the, the unjust. And so we can see uh, a good application there. <clears throat> and so the song then of Moses is about, hey, we've been delivered. Here's people that have been slaves, you know, for 40 years. Here's people who, uh, you know, have been, they've been uh, chased down and they're going to kill them and, they're, and they're, they're just trying to follow the Lord. But they, they just think, hey, we're going to, remember they're even telling Moses, you just brought us here to die. <laughs> you know I mean, no, I actually am rescuing you. But, you know, God's getting you out of here. But then the time comes where they get the victory. And so then they're dancing and singing along and everything. Okay, so then what about the song of the Lamb? Well, we're in Revelation. Uh, so we've already been reading about the, the trials that we have there. We don't know that song. We don't have, and I don't know if the song of Moses is the exact, if we're going to be in heaven singing that exact song of Moses, I don't know. But we certainly don't know what the song of the Lamb is because it has not yet been sung other than that little portion that they give us there in the text where he says, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Now, I don't know if that's the entire song, what it sounds like. I suspect there will be other songs. Uh, but here's what I just think whenever I read that about the songs in heaven. And I think, you know, we'll be there. You know, after the resurrection, we're, we're there, you know, experiencing all this. And we see the 24 elders and we see the beasts and we see the multitudes of people and we join in with them and we're singing the songs. And I think, man, can you imagine? Uh, uh, I love the sound of a big choir, right? And if you've ever had the opportunity to sing in a choir, it's just, it's so neat because you hear all the voices. It's not just like a solo or even like a quartet. Like you hear all the, but when you're in a huge choir, you know, uh, uh, it just, it just is so cool because the, the sound is, is just unexplainable. But can you imagine a choir of just multitudes and multitudes, innumerable amount of people plus angels, plus all these uh, angelic beings, and they're all sitting around, uh, standing around singing this song. And I'm thinking maybe in our glorified bodies we have perfect pitch. I'm just guessing. Maybe we all sing good. <laughs> and it's just sounding so wonderful. Perhaps Asaph is leading us. I can imagine. Asaph is the choir director. Oh, and I watch him, and he's up there, and he's leading the singing. And then, uh, and then we start singing. What's the song of the Lamb going to be? I don't know. Uh, playing around a little bit. And I compared uh, this to Exodus 15, okay? Maybe the song will go something like this. I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The dragon hath been bound up in the pit. His beast and his false prophet are drowned in the lake of fire. We're all jumping around at that point. Miriam, you know, leads all the ladies in the tambourines, and they're <laughs> dancing around, uh, and they uh, are, or, what is it called? Not tambourines, help me out. Ta uh, temporals and dance and they're and she's dancing around and they're all you know whatever sounds like uh i always think about uh prince of egypt when they're all <laughs> if you haven't watched it don't i'm not recommending just i like the soundtrack and so all the uh the ladies are dancing lie 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 and they're just dancing around and they're spinning and they're and, they're, and i'm like oh man what a glorious time we're standing there there's a there's a little interlude where there's instruments and music and we're and, and then he goes on and he says he poured out the noisome and grievous sore upon them that received the mark with heat he scorched them who blasphemed the Lord. I'm just making this up, but I'm saying, you see how the song would be like Moses saying, how glorious God is he. I mean, he's talking about in that, in, Deut in, uh, in not Deuteronomy, uh, Exodus 15, he's talking about, you know, they are dashed to pieces with the rocks. Well, think about what we would be witnessing, you know, in the, when the wrath of God's poured out, you know. He's breaking their necks with giant hailstones. <laughs> I mean, we're watching all this. And you think, well, how could you glory in that? Well, look, everything God does is righteous. Yeah. And when we are in our glorified bodies, you say, well, yeah, but we're all wicked. But we won't be then. And when we're in our glorified bodies and we think of the wickedness that's been done on the earth and the fact that people have rejected Christ and the fact that they blaspheme his name. Now, you can look at those in the uh, when God's wrath is poured out and continuously it keeps saying that they just repented not. 
And they continued to blaspheme his name. And they had received the mark and bowed down and worshipped the beast. And, uh, and I don't know everything that, that, that goes on to lead people to that point. You know, we've talked about it a little bit. But we will see it as God's ultimate righteous be, righteousness being poured out. And it's hard to even think about that right now for, for most people, right? But if you've ever had somebody <clears throat> do you wrong enough, let's say, you know, what if, what if you, somebody had killed your child or raped and molested your child and you witnessed their execution? Now, our society is so messed up now that they'd be like, no, 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 you should never rejoice in that. Hey, look, that's why they used to watch. I think they still do. If they execute somebody, the family can come and watch that person be executed, right? It brings some kind of closure and some kind of satisfaction to know that evil person is gone. Now, look, I'm not rejoicing that anybody goes to hell, all right? But in that day, in our perfect body, when we realize, hey, there's no unrighteousness in heaven, we are washed in the blood of the Lamb, we are no longer unrighteous, but we're watching the wickedness of this world be uh, executed and be punished and then ultimately be thrown into the lake of fire. I'm telling you, we're going to be rejoicing. That's what the Bible says. And so, uh, so this is what I think we're talking about, the song of the Lamb and how it compares to the song of Moses. All right, let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. And I thank you that we live in a in a country that's that's pretty free and we we uh, are able to worship you and have quite a bit of liberties to do so i pray that you'll help us to continue in the faith should the time come and i'm sure it'll come soon where we uh, won't have such liberties and we have to take strong stands and perhaps even get thrown in jail or some martyred for their faith we know in the great tribulation there will be uh executions and and uh, people being martyred uh, in great numbers. And Lord, I pray that you just help us to be faithful and long-suffering and to keep look, uh, keep coming to you in prayer and doing the work that you've called us to do, knowing that when the time comes, you will avenge your uh, elect speedily. I uh, pray you be glorified in all that you do, and we'll be careful to give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.